Welcome to my presentation about space chains. Space chains are a combination of two um, ideas, one being the blind, uh, blind merge mining and the other one being the perpetual one-way peg. And I'm gonna go through both of them and the combined concept is what I call space chains. So the key points are, we're going to create some kind of blockchain, but we're going to do it by outsourcing miner, uh, mining to the Bitcoin blockchain with only a single transaction per block. Uh, meaning that there's not going to be a lot of overhead on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's going to be a trustless chain, uh, multiple trustless chains, as many chains as you like, that can be created permissionlessly, and they essentially serve the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, there's not going to be a competing coin, there's no altcoin, no shenanigans like that. Uh, it's going to function in a way that does not require a speculative asset. So this is uh, hopefully going to open a door to more permissionless innovation, where essentially anyone can create blockchains that serve the Bitcoin ecosystem. So the main thing, the one caveat that needs to be said is that this is not a two-way peg. So this is not going to be a system where you take your Bitcoin, you move to a space chain, and then you do your thing there and you move back. That is not going to be, going to be possible. So you might be thinking now, is this a sidechain? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, I think depending on who you ask, the answer may be yes or maybe no. Um, I, my, so I decided to answer this a little bit more in a indirect way and describing basically what part of a sidechain, kind of the sidechain idea it does uh, hit on. So obviously the one it doesn't hit on is there's no trustless two-way bag. Uh, but the things it does do is it allows permissionless chain creation without another speculative asset. And, and really it serves the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I think that is one of the, at least half of the dream of what kind of the, the sidechain idea was all about. Uh, when the paper original released in 2014, at least that was what I was dreaming of. Um, having all these different chains uh, where you can just move your Bitcoins back and forth. And now, okay, you can't quite move your Bitcoins back and forth, but we still have lots of different chains that somehow serve Bitcoin. So to kind of go through what a space chain is exactly, I want to start very simple, but with a deceptively simple question, which is what is a blockchain? And I think when you hear this question, you might think it's simple, but I think it's actually a difficult question to answer. So the way I want to answer this question is that it's an open database essentially, but it's an open database that is rate limited by sacrifice. And in the case of Bitcoin, obviously the sacrifice is proof of work. Um, and the nice thing about Bitcoin is obviously that um, essentially anyone can create a block. Uh, if too many blocks come in at the same time or within a certain time frame, the difficulty goes up. Um, so this naturally rate limits how many blocks can be created. And this sort of makes sure that even though it's an open database that anybody can add data to, uh, there's never going to be too much data. There's only going to be roughly two megabytes every every 10 minutes. So the interesting thing is that the resulting scarcity, at least in the way Bitcoin did it, uh, can be tokenized uh, because there can only be one block every 10 minutes if you add a block reward there and you create, say, 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And then, you know, after a couple of years, 12 and a half, 6.25, et cetera, that's the way Bitcoin uh, issues new tokens. And then once you have tokens, uh, the system is kind of bootstrapped, right? We have, uh, we have a scarce token that everybody can use. Uh, but the, the one interesting thing that I think is quite underappreciated is that Satoshi Nakamoto came up with a way to do mining or leave it to other people to do mining. Uh, and, and the importance of that cannot be understated. Uh, you don't have to take your transaction and put it into your block yourself and mine it. Uh, but what you can do is you can just add a fee and any anyone can take it. You send it over through the P2P network and anyone can take those transactions, put them into a block and claim the fee for themselves if they're successful. And that's a non-interactive process. And that is really one of the key things that makes Bitcoin work. And maybe it looks obvious in hindsight, but I don't think it was that obvious. And it turns out that this is quite a key feature uh, to kind of recreate yet another blockchain. You need to have a feature like this. Um, so roughly what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create yet another blockchain or multiple blockchains. Uh, but we want to skip the uh, tokenization step. We don't want to create yet another uh, Bitcoin competitor, yet another altcoin. Uh, but everything else we kind of need, right? We need an open database that's rate limited by sacrifice. Uh, 
and we need uh, some kind of way to outsource uh, the, the mining where we just send our transaction and somebody else puts it into a block for us. So these two features are basically what we're going to try and recreate. So first, creating a blockchain, how do you do that? Well, uh, the mechanism I'm using here is called blind merge mining. And essentially you use BTC, you use the Bitcoin blockchain or use the Bitcoins uh, to sort of simulate or emulate mining. Uh, and what you do, like with Bitcoin, you have proof of work, and that's a way to show that you uh, sacrifice something, uh, provably. But now that we have Bitcoin, we can do it in other ways, right? We can say, okay, well, I, you know, maybe I burn a Bitcoin, uh, or maybe I lock up my Bitcoins, or maybe I waste a bunch of block space on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a terrible idea. Don't do that, uh, but it works. Uh, or, and this is my personal uh, way I think this should be going, is through something called fee bidding. So fee bidding is, uh, in my opinion, the, the better of these uh, options, although they all can work to some extent. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's very space efficient and it's fully incentive compatible, where um, if somebody tries to censor you, it essentially works the same way Bitcoin works, where it, it's costly to censor somebody. And in terms of space efficiency, as I already told you, what we're gonna get it down to is one transaction per block. So there's also regular merge mining, and I have to uh, specify that this is actually better than regular merge mining, uh, because with regular merge mining, what you need is you need Bitcoin miners to essentially um, participate and run the software and create blocks for you. And here in this system, what I wanna do is anybody can create a block and anybody can propose it to the miners and the miners just take take whatever uh, pays them the most uh, basically in Bitcoin fees here. Um, so what how that works out is that the mining is completely separated from the Bitcoin miners. Anybody can do it and the Bitcoin miners they just do their usual thing where they just take the transaction with the highest fees. Uh, we'll get into more detail uh, about how that works later. And just uh, to, to give you a rough preview of what's going to happen, I'm going to give you kind of a simplistic overview, and then I'm going to go into the actual details, the technical details. So uh, either way, you'll, you'll get your answers. So fee bidding, blind merge mining. What's that all about? Well, you can at a high level imagine there being a unique location for a blockchain hash in the Bitcoin blockchain. There's only one location. Uh, if you want to utilize it, you'll have to outbid others for it. So anybody can bid for this unique location by offering Bitcoin fees to the Bitcoin miners and whoever pays the highest fee gets their hash included. Uh, so it's an auction and the auction winner gets the block and therefore gets the block on this other space chain that they have created, uh, presumably through this blind merge mining process. So the original idea, as far as I know, is from Paul Stortz. Uh, and he uh, basically, the way he had envisioned it, it requires a soft fork. And what I've come up with here is a way to kind of avoid having to do at least a specialized soft fork. Uh, so you don't need a soft fork that literally is only in order to uh, enable blind merge mining. Uh, you can even do it without a soft fork, but there are some sacrifices and we'll get into that uh, later on. Uh, but this kind of uh, means essentially that now, since there's no longer a specific software required, um, it's kind of inevitable. This is going to happen. So just to give you a better idea, let me show you with some pictures. Imagine the Bitcoin blockchain and this little pink uh, blob is this unique location uh, that people have to uh, bid for. Uh, so it's a hash and the hash refers to a space chain block. And the way consensus works is just the next Bitcoin blocks com block comes in and then there's also another space chain hash in there and referring to a space chain block. So what's important to note here is that this blockchain can fork separately from the Bitcoin blockchain. So how that works is as follows. Here, for instance, another block two is found block two B and it's mining on top of block one A. So now you have a fork, uh, both are length two, but we don't know which the winner is. And the winner is simply determined by literally which is the longest chain. So once another block is found, now we know the winner, 2A is orphaned and 2B is essentially the winner. Um, of course, this could change again, uh, but uh, assuming consensus just moves forward, uh, this is now the state of the network. So uh, one way of looking at this, and I think it's an important abstraction, is to say that this is essentially like a single use seal 
And a single use seal is a, is a concept or an abstraction, uh, I, an idea that was uh, thought of by Peter Todd, where it's essentially um, the idea is that every UTXO on the Bitcoin blockchain is like a little box that you can open once, you can take out the content, you can put it in other boxes, but it's single use, right? You can only open the box once. And here we have kind of a similar concept, except that the box is not opened by whoever holds some kind of private key, uh, but it's a box that literally uh, can kind of be used or, 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 or clo closing the seal, in this case is the analogy, uh, by whoever pays the most to the Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin fees. Um, and the reason I wanna kind of point that out is because right now I'm using this for blind merge mining, but that's not necessarily the only use case. Uh, there are other ways in which this can be used as well, and I'll leave that to your imagination. So roughly speaking, uh, this process of having this unique hash and having people bid for it is roughly analogous to proof of work, except there are a few changes, a few differences, uh, and they're relatively minor. So first, there's no difficulty, as you might've noticed. Uh, but it's not entirely true. Uh, difficulty is actually inherited from Bitcoin uh, because the Bitcoin blockchain ensures that it can only be one unique hash every 10 minutes. Uh, so this is essentially how the difficulty works out. And all the fees uh, that go to the Bitcoin miners, they are also turned into proof of work. So they are part of the, the difficulty algorithm, essentially. So there is no difficulty in the blind merge mining side uh, on the space chain, but there is an actual kind of difficulty that is inherited from the Bitcoin blockchain. So the second thing is, well, the highest bidder always finds the block. Um, and that is somewhat different. It's kind of like, mm, how would I say it? It's like uh, hashing power is just like anybody can can uh, mine with any kind of CPU, for instance, where it's it's relatively easy to go to, go to Amazon and, and rent a bunch of uh, hash power. And you can just take over blockchain. It's kind of like that, where as long as you're willing to pay the most money, uh, you get to uh, create the block, but it is still competitive. So in that sense, it still works. And the interesting thing is that every user is essentially a miner, as long as they have some Bitcoins and are willing to pay some Bitcoins to, to, to create a block. Um, so it creates a very competitive ecosystem. Um, so forks are possible, but they play out sequentially. Uh, as we saw uh, in a couple of previous slides, um, essentially, if you you know remember the block 2A, block 2B, when block 2B is created, block 2A is not being built on top of, right? It's not possible because there's only one uh, unique uh, hash where a block can be put. So even during a reorg, let's say you want a 100 block reorg, that means that the chain basically stands still for 100 blocks. Um, and that's actually a good thing because it makes the reorg uh, more difficult to think of like low proof of work uh, blockchains where out of nowhere, suddenly 100 blocks can appear and be the longest chain and you're just screwed, right? Like there's suddenly there's a reorg. And here at the very least you see it coming, uh, you can respond by trying to build on top of the uh, currently longest chain by paying higher fees, et cetera. So I think game theory wise, it actually works out a little better in favor of uh, having consensus move forward. So uh, this is also a kind of funny thing, but the minority a minority soft fork or even a minority hard fork that is trying to utilize the same unique spot uh, can survive because the only blockchain that will appear is the one that pays the most uh, money, the most uh, fees to the Bitcoin miners. So if you have two blockchains that are trying to compete for the same spot, the highest paying one simply wins. Uh, this can be good or bad depending on how you look at it. Uh, there's always a way to hard fork out of it by just picking a different unique spot. It has to be a, a unique spot, but there can be multiple. Uh, and finally, uh, this also needs to be pointed out, is that you have to validate the parents, right? Or the parents, even if you have a space chain inside of a space chain. Uh, and the reason for this is that the um, the parents is basically where the fees are being paid. Um, and there's, yeah, there's actually one more step that I'll get into later uh, that makes a space chain a space chain, which is the perpetual one-way peg. And that requires also uh, the pa parents to be validated. So the main thing that is preserved here is the censorship resistance. Uh, miners lose income if they try to censor anything. Uh, if they don't want to put your blind merge mine space chain block into the blockchain, they can do so. But if you're the highest paying uh, person, they are losing fees. And if they're losing fees, they're not competitive against other Bitcoin miners. Um, so it works out uh, exactly the same in that sense. So that brings me to uh, paying for block space. Okay, so we've got this blockchain now. And we have a mechanism, blind merge mining, to create these blocks. Uh, 
But now we still need a way to pay uh, people to uh, to pay miners to to put your transaction in, right? We don't have a token yet, uh, similar to what I was saying about Bitcoin, where that was quite the innovation that you could use your Bitcoins to pay fees. How do we pay fees here? So, what are our options? Well. The simple but rather silly uh, solution would be to create an altcoin, right? And as I said earlier, we don't want to do that. So that's a no-go. Uh, a cool but way too complicated uh, idea. Maybe someone can think of some way of doing this properly, but it is uh, I can tell you it's quite difficult, uh, is pay out of band, where you essentially maybe pay over the Lightning Network or something along those lines, and then your transaction you know, you pay the miner and the miner adds the transaction. But the problem with this is that it's very difficult to make it so that uh, these two are kind of synchronous, right? Where um, there, are, there are multiple miners and now how do you know which one to pay? How do you know that after you pay them, they actually put your transaction into the block? Uh, these are all problems. So um, long story short, it is uh, at least as to my current knowledge, too difficult uh, to make this happen and not really uh, practical. So that brings me to the third and final solution, which is burning your Bitcoins. Uh, and this is actually a, 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 an old idea that I kind of like brought back to life. And it turns out that it works better than you might expect. So let's, uh, let's get into that. Uh, but before, I just want to say that because we don't have a new token being created, we don't have a block subsidy. Uh, so the reorg incentives are different than how it works out with Bitcoin, right? With Bitcoin, we still have a block subsidy, but once that goes down to zero, uh, now the reorg incentives are a little different. So we basically run into that problem sooner here. And that's important to point out. Uh, it's, it's not a trivial problem uh, to really ensure that the blockchain moves forward, but, but it is definitely a, a solvable problem. So at the very least, it's not a showstopper. Okay, so... The burning Bitcoin part, which I call the perpetual one-way peg. One-way peg meaning as opposed to two-way peg, you can move your Bitcoins to this other chain, but one way so you can never move back, which is why it's a burn, right? You destroy your coins and you get some space chain tokens. And it's perpetual, uh, meaning that you can always do this. So for every Bitcoin you burn, get a space coin. Uh, this preserves the 21 million limit essentially, so that's great. Uh, there's not, you know, it's, it's seeing the whole space chain plus Bitcoin ecosystem still preserve the 21 million limit, I think is a, is a very important uh, aspect of this, right? Where there is literally no inflation. So this is important to note as well, which is that Bitcoin is always a superior asset. It's absolutely not a competitor. If you move from Bitcoin to some kind of space chain, now you're stuck in a space chain, you can't go back. But if you just hold your Bitcoins, you do nothing, you can always move to a space chain later. Uh, so that's always a superior option. Uh, there is really very little incentive to actually burn your Bitcoins and move over, but there are some which I'll get into. Uh, the token essentially has only one use case, and, and, and that's, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say, which is that you only use it to pay for block space. That's literally the only use case. So the way it works out is that you essentially, um, you burn a few Bitcoins or, or Satoshis, whatever, get some space, space Satoshis, space coin Satoshis. And those are the only thing you use to pay for fees, pay for block space. And I'd say the, the most important thing here is that there's really no meaningful speculation you could do with this token, right? It's never going to be worth more than a Bitcoin. So why would you speculate on it? Why would you move over to this chain more than you actually need? Uh, so what's most likely going to happen is that you're just going to see roughly how much block space demand there is. So let's say there's, I don't know, one Bitcoin worth of um, block space in terms of fees every couple of blocks or something like that, then there really will be only one Bitcoin burned in total. And that will be sufficient to pay for all the fees for everyone essentially on this chain. And it's going to be kind of a loop, right? Where the uh, Blight Merge mined uh, space chain miners, they get the fees and they sell the fees again and then you can use them again, etc. So that's kind of where you have your, um, you know, either through the Lightning Network or whatever, where you, when you need some space coins to pay for fees, you just buy them or you just hold a little amount, like $5 or $10 or whatever, depending on how popular the space chain is and how high the fees are. So that actually 
because it's so uninteresting to speculate on this token, it actually creates a lot of stability for the token. Where the only the only way the token kind of loses value is there's a lot of demand for block space, and then the demand for block space goes down again. Uh, then the token goes down in value a little bit, but even that's not too uh, important or too um, too problematic because you're not supposed to be holding a lot of these these coins, right? So maybe you had ten bucks worth of uh, the space chain uh, coin, and then okay, now you have five bucks. Okay, yeah, it sucks. It's not great. Uh, but you can still utilize the chain for its utility. You know, nothing is really lost except for like a little bit of value, which was not supposed to be worth much in the first place. Uh, Fernando Nieto, or Nito, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, he wrote an article which is called Soft Pegged Sidechains, uh, where he goes into uh, some more details. And I also post in the comment section. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of the topic of how to maintain the peg stability, at least somewhat, uh, you can, you can, find more information there. So, and uh, this is important to note, there's a real limitation here, right? Like this is not a token where you're gonna store your value. It literally cannot act as a store of value. You'd be crazy to move in a million dollars into a space chain and expect to get your value back somehow when you sell the token to, to a third party. Uh, that's never gonna happen. Uh, really, you. so that is the, the one limitation where the only use cases for these chains are things that do not require you to have a store of value on there or decentralized store of value, I should say. Um, so that might raise the question, well, what are these chains good for if you can't store value? Well, we're going to get into that. Uh, but first, I want to mention that I think a lot of people have this feeling where, wait a second, you're asking me to burn my Bitcoins? That really feels bad, man. I don't want to burn my Bitcoins. and. Um, Yes, I understand the feeling, uh, but it really isn't bad, is all I can say. Um, it's a feeling uh, and you should get over it because it's not logical and I'm going to explain why. Um, so first, the alternatives are worse, right? You could have some competing altcoin if you prefer, and then you don't have to burn your Bitcoins, but now you have to sell your Bitcoins to get the altcoin. Um, is that better? I don't think so, uh, because that's not a chain you want to use, right? You don't want to use Ethereum, you don't want to use Dash or whatever. Um, you want kind of the, the value and ecosystem to be with Bitcoin. And that's really kind of a key thing here uh, that uh, this whole idea is trying to uh, accomplish where it's supposed to build the Bitcoin ecosystem, not create competitors for Bitcoin. You could also have some kind of trusted IOU token. Um, you know, you could have a USD Tether chain or something. And I have an example of that later on in the presentation. Uh, but that, you know, runs into the issue of that you're trusting an entity, right? And that's the whole thing we're trying to avoid here. We're trying to be trustless. So these are not better alternatives. There, there really isn't an alternative, actually. This is really as good as it gets in terms of avoiding these much more massive problems. So second thing that unfortunately isn't obvious to everybody who hears this, but you don't have to burn your Bitcoins. Somebody has to burn their Bitcoins. And then once that happened, they can sell their, those tokens, those space, uh, space coins to you. Uh, so you can buy them from somebody who already has space coins or buy them from uh, space chain miners who receive them whenever they create a block uh, and that can be sufficient. So it, it's not necessarily that everybody burns some Bitcoins. It's just, it just needs to happen to a certain degree. So there are some tokens on this chain and then that's sufficient. And so this is something I mentioned already, but it's, it's good to repeat it, uh, which you really only need to burn as much as there's block space demand, right? If there's one Bitcoin demand, one Bitcoin worth of demand, basically, uh, then only one Bitcoin needs to be burned. Uh, that would be sufficient. There's going to be some friction in the system where obviously you're not going to get, uh, you know, you create a block and then the miners get the, the space coins and then they sell them on the market again and the next block appears. Maybe it's possible to get to create really efficient markets where that happens instantly. I don't know. Uh, but my guess is that, you know, um, there's going to be a little bit of friction there and people are going to hold on to some of these space coins a little bit. Uh, but not uh, not to a massive degree. And finally, it's just good. I mean, what this means is that other people are going to be burning their Bitcoins, which means your Bitcoins are going to be worth more because they're more scarce now. Uh, so really, it's good for Bitcoin, right? If, uh, if half the Bitcoins disappear tomorrow, uh, it means your Bitcoins should be worth twice as much. Uh, and that is that is how that works. So really, there is no downside here, right? You don't have to burn your Bitcoin. Somebody else can do it. Uh, there doesn't have to be a lot of Bitcoins burned. And if Bitcoins are burned, 
I'm not complaining. I think it's great, right? More, more Bitcoins for me, basically, <laughs> in terms of relative value. So that brings me to the use cases, and that's not an unimportant thing, right? So, so far I've talked about this. Okay, so we've got a blockchain, uh, but it can't store value. Uh, there's no two-way peg. So what the hell is this good for? Uh, and that's a really good question that maybe I should have answered a little sooner, but I'm answering it now. Uh, and I think the main use case, or at least the, the one that I think uh, connects to the most people, is essentially color coins. Uh, you could have color coins with privacy features or something like that, so asset issuance. Um, so once you have this chain where tokens can be created, and these tokens can be anything, they can be rare Pepe's, they can be uh, whatever if you want to do security tokens or something, I'm not a big fan, but sure, go ahead. Uh, you can even create a token that is a federated two-way peg where it actually represents Bitcoins, uh, but obviously there's a trust um, there's a, there's a trust involved there where whoever issued the token is actually promising you that you're going to get a Bitcoin for the token, similar to the Liquid Network. Um, but, you know, it's possible. And people can use it in that way, where you kind of have a hybrid of people issuing tokens on this trustless decentralized chain. And then the tokens themselves might not be fully trustless, but that's up to you to decide whether or not you want to hold that token. And of course, it can have privacy features. It could be a Mimble Wimble chain even, or it could be like Liquid where it has uh, confidential transactions. Uh, you could do decentralized DNS, and this would essentially replace Namecoin, where with Namecoin, you basically have the functionality of decentralized DNS, but I think the uh, existence of a speculative asset inside of a chain such as Namecoin is a problem. Uh, and you know, not to say that Namecoin uh, had a better solution back then, like we didn't have a better solution to the problem. So it's completely understandable that they created an altcoin. Uh, but I think for today, looking at that, um, the altcoin only adds friction, right? It only adds pumps and dumps, meaning that your, your coin might go heavily up, heavily down in value. And you don't really want that, right? You just want to utilize the chain. You just want to, to have DNS. Um, so the existence of the speculative token, I think, is a complete negative, and we can get rid of that essentially and reissue something like Namecoin, take out the speculative asset and replace it with the perpetual runway peg and use Black Merge mining. So even all the mining fees kind of go to the Bitcoin network as well, uh, which also helps Bitcoin to become more uh, uh, resilient. So then the third use case, and I think this one is a bit of a stretch, but it might be possible. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. It's weird. Um, which is low value payments, right? This, so essentially think of, um, you know, kind of the Bitcoin cash dream, right? Where the idea was, well, we want our low value payments on the blockchain. Block should never be full. Transactions should always be cheap. Um, so you could do that provided everybody is willing to hold like five to $10 worth of these, these space coins. You know, not a lot of value. You don't really care whether it goes down in value a whole lot. And then you use that to create small transactions, but on chain, on a bigger blockchain that you don't have to use if you don't want, right? It's an opt-in chain. Um, so it really provides kind of the Bitcoin Cash use case. Um, the, the only thing that's questionable is whether the token really holds any value. So you'd have to think like, okay, so let's say if you're receiving a lot of these microtransactions, after a while you have like a hundred bucks of them, uh, well, you better cash them out quickly, right? Because is not really a place where you just want to keep gathering and, and suddenly you have like thousands of these uh, these tokens because uh, by the time you want to sell them and, and a bunch of people uh, want to sell them, then you know the, the value might go down. So you got to be careful there. Uh, but I, I do think it works at least like to a, a lesser degree, right? For maybe really small payments as long as blocks are not full. And you, know, you can maybe experiment a little bit with uh, more dangerous chains that have way too big block sizes. And then finally, you can have DAOs, you can have DeFi, you can have DEXs. Uh, I'm going to give a more like specific example of kind of what kind of use case you can have there. Uh, but for DAOs, for instance, I, I know BISC has a sort of like uh, a colored coin DAO that's currently operating on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. I think that's going to be a problem. Um, when Bitcoin blocks become fuller than they are now and transaction fees go up, uh, something like that just can't exist efficiently on the Bitcoin blockchain and we'll have to move. And, and I think this is kind of the place where we have to move. And then the DeFi the DEX stuff is kind of like the Ethereum use case or, or like the, the stuff that they're doing. Some of that, I think, can be tied to Bitcoin through these chains and we'll get into that later. So 
That brings me to the technical details. So from this point on, it's going to get a little bit more difficult to follow. Hopefully uh, you can still kind of follow everything. Uh, I'll try to keep it as straightforward as possible. And at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll give you a couple more kind of use case examples, uh, a little bit more like practical. So please stick around for that. Okay, so under the hood, uh, first a few technical things and then I'll show some pictures, so, so bear with me. Um, so essentially what we're creating is a sequence of transactions. Uh, they're enforced by a covenant and there's a relative lock time of one block. So you just have a, a bunch of transactions and one transaction per block can get into the blockchain. We use Sigash anyone can pay plus Sigash single. And what this does is that we have this kind of input and outputs that uh, marks the covenant. And then we have in other inputs and outputs that come from users that they can add. Uh, and they add them to pay for fees and they add them to add their blockchain uh, space chain hash, uh, basically attach it to this transaction. It's RBF enabled. Uh, and that means that anyone can pay for inclusion. Uh, so you can you have to basically outbid each other. And that's how we get the fee bidding. And the, yeah, so the space chain block hash can be committed in the added output, but we can do this through uh, basically uh, the equivalent of the taproot commitment. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, uh, although it could be. And what that does is that basically the even the hash doesn't appear on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's pay, that saves another 32 bytes. It's not absolutely necessary. You can also just use an up return, uh, but it's more efficient. So uh, there will be even more details later, but here are some pictures. So imagine a transaction here with a covenant input to covenant output, and we'll get into the details of the covenant later. Um, so the user adds their inputs and outputs, uh, and through RBF bidding, essentially, uh, this determines who gets to add their input and outputs. So let's say you put one Bitcoin as a user input, and then 0 0.95 as a user output. That means you, you paid 0 0.05 Bitcoin as a fee. And then somebody else comes along, and they pay 0 0.06, uh, which is higher, and therefore your transaction doesn't get in, but the other guy's transaction does get in. So the highest one, let's say 0 0.06, gets mined into a block. So now with the user output, they reveal their taproot commitment to the peer-to-peer uh, -peer network of the, of the space chain, uh, including the whole block itself. And that's basically how the space chain block comes into existence. So in the space chain block, there is a user coin base which is where they aggregate their space chain fees. So they get all the fees on the space chain and that uh, that decides basically how much uh, they're willing to pay on the Bitcoin side, right? So in this case, 0 0.06 Bitcoin means that on a space chain, they should have received roughly the equivalent of that. Uh, yeah, so once that, uh, once the next block is created, it's exactly the same thing, right? Same covenant. Uh, the covenant is also connected, right? So the covenant output is the covenant input for the next transaction and everything else is exactly the same. So it just repeats over and over. So that brings us to the question to how to do the covenant. Um, so there are a couple of ways of doing it. Um, so one way would be kind of a trusted setup uh, and this would use child pays for parents. Uh, the nice thing is that this trusted setup works today. Uh, I say trusted in quotes because basically what it is is where you have the covenant input and output. Uh, you could just have a private key and you could just put a signature there. And you can then, after you created a bunch of signatures and all of these transactions, like 10,000 or, or million of these transactions, uh, you just throw away the private key with which you created this, uh, these, uh, this sequence of transactions. Then assuming you really did throw away the key, it is as good as a covenant. But that's where the problem is. You don't know if the key was thrown away. Well, the nice thing is it doesn't matter a whole lot. It, it, it's not a good thing and there are better ways of doing it. Uh, but if you want to do it without a soft fork, uh, then that's, that will be the way. Uh, the downside is that let's say uh, that person didn't throw away the key. They can then basically fork this sequence of transactions. And what that means is that the chain just halts. So nobody loses money. There's not going to be any reorgs or something weird like that. Uh, the chain halts and then a hard fork has to occur to restart the chain. So it's not terrible, uh, you know, not, you know, preferably this doesn't happen, but nobody loses any money essentially. So that's why I think it's acceptable to do it like kind of as a first step, but we can do better. So one, one of the better ways would be op check, check template verify. This would also require child pays for parents, uh, RBF as well, by the way, both of these, but child pays for parent as well. And, um, 
Uh, while that is one way of doing it, and this is a Jeremy Rubin's idea, so this is a soft fork that is kind of in the works that may or may not come to Bitcoin. Um, uh, I think this is a absolutely a perfectly fine way of doing it, but my preference goes to using Sigash AnyPrevout. And Sigash AnyPrevout is actually a soft fork that is, I think, maybe slightly more likely to make it into Bitcoin or, or might come to Bitcoin sooner than object check template verify, but who knows. Um, and it's actually intended for kind of improving the Lightning Network through something called L2, E-L-T-O-O. -O. Um, and it, it actually turns out that for this specific covenant that I'm trying to create, um, it is slightly more flexible than up check template verify. So up check template verify and, and Sigus any profile turns out they can do roughly the same thing. Uh, up check template verify is rough, is usually the cleaner way of doing it. Uh, but in this case, I think there's an argument to be made for Sigus any profile because basically the transactions become a little smaller and things are a little bit more flexible. And, and, we'll, and we'll see that in a minute. So I'm going to go and take you through the Sigus any profile methods of uh, creating this covenant. Uh, and this, uh, so I'm starting really simple here. And uh, yeah, I, sh I guess I should note um, this kind of uh, Sigus any out was not intended to do the covenant, but it just turned out that it happens to enable this. Uh, so it's actually kind of cool. And this is something that Anthony, Anthony Towns uh, taught me. Um, so yeah, I'll take you through it, kind of how it works. Um, so imagine just a regular output, a very simple one where just a pub key and a check sig. Um, so the way to spend this would be with a signature, right? So when you spend it, you just put the signature in the input script and the signature signs the transaction it's signing and uh, the transaction it's creating and uh, the, the previous transaction is trying to spend essentially. So what happens if we take the signature and we just move it, right? We just move it to the output script. So there is a problem here. Uh, this doesn't actually work if you just do this. And why doesn't it work? Well, there is a circular reference here, right? I, as I told you, the signature is, is, is signing two things and basically the, the, the red, red bars you see here is what it's signing. So it signs a new transaction, but it also signs itself. And that becomes a circular reference, right? The signature itself is signing the signature uh, and that doesn't work. Um, so the way to solve this is, well, that's exactly what SIGAS AnyPrevout does. What SIGAS AnyPrevout does is it allows you to skip signing a transaction ID. So you're not signing the actual transaction that you're spending. Uh, you're just kind of assuming that they fit. Um, and with this, we've basically un un we've solved the, uh, the issue, uh, the circular reference. And, and now it actually works out where you already have the signature of the next transaction in the previous transaction. And that makes it a covenant. So now that it's a covenant, we don't really need K there. We can just replace it by G. Uh, G is uh, the generator. It's just basically your private key is one. Uh, that's what it means. So there is no real private key there, but in order to stay compatible with how Bitcoin works, we do need to have a key there. So the key is just private key one. Great. Uh, this makes uh, creating the signature really easy because it's basically just a hash plus one. Uh, there's, there's no calculation needed at all. Um, and yeah, this just uh, works essentially. So we just create a sequence of transactions like this uh, with the signature already in the output. That means that it's already determined what the next transaction is gonna be. Uh, and that's how the sequence is created. And from this point on, we add the user input and user output. And a nice thing is that the, the, the uh, SIGAS any provide does two things because the TXID is not signed. It also means that the TXID doesn't change when a user adds their inputs and input and output, or rather it does change, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't invalidate the signature. Um, so that works out perfectly. Uh, so here, it's important to note that the user input does sign the entire transaction and doesn't do uh, SIGAS any provide or something like that. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, well, so guess, yeah, I'm not sure if that matters specifically, but what you need is you need to make sure that the entire uh, sequence of transactions can't be replayed so that people who were bidding uh, but didn't get into the blockchain uh, then still get into the blockchain, but in a way that's not actually a valid block. Uh, so that's not possible because the entire transaction is signed. So the TXID at that point for, for at least the user input and output is uh, basically determined and cannot change. So this prevents further malleability. 
So the space chain hash is basically a chain's output. So you can think of like a taproot output where instead of taproot commitments, there's also a space chain hash that needs to be revealed at some, at some point. And this basically lowers the, the burden uh, or, or moves the burden of, of revealing a hash uh, onto a kind of the space chain side and, and makes the impact on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, as minimum as possible. So that brings me to um, describing what essentially would be a minimum viable space chain. So when you, if you wanted to create a space chain, what's the minimum amount of work you could do to, to get it to work today? So I would say you take the Bitcoin coin code base and you introduce some minor changes, relatively minor. So the first change you have to make is the proof of work. So you take the proof of work and you just keep it, but you just make it so that any amount of proof of work is, is, is valid. So nobody actually has to do any proof of work to create a valid hash. Um, it, it's just difficulty set to zero. So then on the Coinbase reward side, uh, you, you have to do two things. One is, is the regular thing you always do, which is you just take the space chain fees, which is fine, right? There's a token in this, instead of Bitcoin, it's a space coin. If there are fees, they go into the Coinbase. That's absolutely fine. But then the second thing you have to do is you have to take however many Bitcoins were burned on the Bitcoin blockchain. And the way this works is that you would just introduce that into uh, into this transaction structure here, right? Where you add another output with an op return, op return uh, doubles as a as way of, of burning Bitcoins. And however many Bitcoins were burned inside of this transaction, <clears throat> uh, yeah, they uh, they basically become a Coinbase reward on the side of the, of the space chain. And then since we're using the op return for burning anyway, um, and it's a little bit easier so you don't have to reveal the hash, although you know you might as well do the hash reveal thing. It just makes things more complicated. We're talking about an M MVS, right? A minimum viable space chain here. Um, you just use up return to put a 32 byte hash there. Not the, you know, not the most efficient thing, but, but it's, um, it's the simplest way of doing it essentially. And then finally, since we don't really want to you know, wait for soft forks, and that's something we've seen, right? Soft forks are taking quite a long time to activate. So instead of waiting for them, uh, I suggest we just use the trusted setup today. Even though it's not perfect, it's good enough, right? At, at the worst case scenario is that the chain halts and has to be hard forked, hard forked to be restarted, uh, but it's not terrible. And it only happens if the person who created the sequence of transactions uh, doesn't throw away their private key, which I think is also, you know, there's not a whole lot of gain there to keep the private key. So it can be acceptable. It's not ideal, but if we want to get started today, that's how we have to do it. So for this reason, I think it's good to show you what this kind of like trusted setup method looks like. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail, but essentially, instead of having one transaction in the Bitcoin blockchain, you now need two transactions. The second one, child pays for parents, uh, the first one, uh, and the second one can be RBF'd. Uh, that's roughly how it works. So it's the same thing. It's just more transactions. So that brings me to kind of a more, um, I guess, elaborate example, right? So I've given you an example here of like a minimum viable chain, but that's sort of boring. So let me give you a little bit more of a spicy uh, example. So this will be a USD Tether or whatever, whoever wants to issue USD, uh, can be anyone, uh, kind of a DEX space chain. So the first thing to note is that, um, and this is something uh, uh, kind of interesting that uh, Shores Provost actually mentioned to me. And uh, yeah, I hadn't really realized until he pointed it out. Uh, but if you have a space chain that is specialized in existing all for the for the use of a, of one single token like USD Tether, uh, then you don't actually need to perpetual a one-way pack, right? It, it's not perfect in the sense that okay, so you have this you know this token that's not trustless, so the whole chain is kind of not entirely trustless, but you still have this um, you know, the way the blockchain moves forward is still completely it, that that part is trustless. Right, so it, there's still a benefit of to doing that. So in the case of having a USD Tether chain, which is really exclusively for that purpose, you don't need the perpetual one-way peg, you just issue USD Tether and you use that to pay for fees to, to the miners of this chain. So then one thing you can do is you can create a Bitcoin derivatives covenant. And this can be done trustlessly without an Oracle. And the reason for that is that, uh, as I mentioned before, you, if you run the space chain, you also have to run the Bitcoin blockchain. And what that means is that you can have consensus in the space chain be dependent on what happens in the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's really nice uh, because that allows us to kind of do, 
something uh, along the lines of sort of like a semi, like an atomic swap that is semi-native, uh, but only like halfway because it's only like on the Bitcoin side. Uh, and this allows us to create sort of a, you know, it's not quite a two-way peg, but it's a way to have a, a something that is like the value of Bitcoin inside of this USD uh, tether chain. So I'll, I'll get into uh, the exact details in, in a second. <clears throat> So then once we have this USD Tether and we have these Bitcoin derivatives, at that point, you can swap them out, right? You can just trade with those. Uh, you could create like special trading contracts, like, like what they do in Ethereum or something like that. Um, any, uh, all of that stuff. So the Bitcoin derivatives uh, covenants, what, what does it look like? <clears throat> so here you can imagine a contract. Uh, so this is going to be a transaction, right? A contract representing let's say one bitcoin and for the current example let's say one bitcoin equals twenty uh, twenty thousand dollars so alice who is basically the contract facilitator and normally she would receive a fee for that but we're leaving it out for simplicity she puts in half a bitcoin worth of usd tether so 10 10k and then bob who actually wants to have this contract he he wants to have the bitcoin so he's the one paying the fee he puts in 20K and 20K is exactly what one Bitcoin is worth. So on the output side, there's 30K in total, obviously. So the question is who gets the 30K and when? So the first condition is if Bob receives one Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, and remember, like I said, this can be verified, right? The, the, the space chain is aware of what happens on the Bitcoin blockchain. So if this, it was actually, uh, if this actually happened and Bob received the Bitcoin, then Alice can claim the full 30K. So she gets her 10K back and the 20K that was originally the price of the, of the Bitcoin. So the second way in which this can uh, end up is there's a timeout. So Bob never received his one Bitcoin and just nothing happened. And Alice was just lazy and did nothing. Then Bob can get both the, um, the uh, 10K, which is essentially collateral, plus the 20K he put in originally. So he's... He's 10K richer, essentially, depending on what the Bitcoin price is, but that's what the collateral is for, to kind of have enough there that even, even with a price swing of uh, 50%, you're still uh, fine. So the third thing you can do, which kind of makes it more of a token, <clears throat> is that you can, you can create a covenant out of it, right? Where you can allow Bob to swap out. So everything in the contract stays the same, but everywhere where you see Bob, now it says Carol, for instance. So Bob can sell this, this contract worth one Bitcoin because he's going to get one Bitcoin towards the end of the contract, he can sell it to Carol. And then everywhere where it says Bob, it now says Carol. So that essentially tokenizes this contract. Um, yeah, and, and so one thing he can do is he can even sell it back to Alice, right? And then there's never, Alice never actually has to get give a Bitcoin because uh, Alice just holds the entire contract at that point. Uh, so because of that, it doesn't have to end up that uh, Alice even gives a Bitcoin to Bob, right? You can you can end up by just settling, which is kind of like the cooperative close in, in, in a Lightning Network, right? Where you don't really want everything to play out. You just want to agree that if it plays out, you know how it's going to play out. So you just pay each other and you're done with it. Um, so one last caveat that I have to point out here is that there's a race condition, which is that Bob can transfer the covenant to Carol while Alice is paying Bob one Bitcoin. And in order to prevent that, you actually need Alice to be able to first disable the covenant, uh, whether you want to do that temporarily or not, that's a design detail. And then at that point, then you give the Bitcoin and that ensures that this race condition doesn't occur. So that's a kind of a cool, cool way of, even though it's not a real Bitcoin, it's still like Bitcoin. And some people call that a sidechain. I don't think it should be called a sidechain when something like that happens, but you know, you could, you could call it that. Um, so, you know, it, it gives you a glimpse into kind of what is possible. And there's probably far more than I thought of that is possible because you can create any chain you want. And that's really awesome. So just to give you kind of a potential future idea of like where this could potentially be headed. And, you know, obviously I don't know, but this is what I imagine would be good for Bitcoin. So you have the Bitcoin blockchain, roughly two megabytes. I know it's like 4,000 weight units or something like that, but roughly two megabytes worth of data. So then you have a space chain, which let's say utilizes the exact same code as Bitcoin does. 
Um, reason for that being that we want people to feel secure in, in using that chain. And then from that chain, you create your other chains. And this is essentially to minimize the amount of Bitcoin uh, space you're, you use. And maybe you create a big blockchain like we talked about with 32 megabytes worth of data or something like that. And what you have here is on the Bitcoin blockchain, there's only one transaction per block, right? And that creates the space chain. And then from that space chain, we have the exact same construction creating the, the big block space chain. Uh, so it's very efficient in terms of how much uh, Bitcoin space you're utilizing here. Um, so then maybe you have a confidential assets space chain, which maybe make it a little bit bigger because I don't know, we feel like that's good enough. Um, and in this chain, you can create your own assets. They can be confidential, so you don't really see the history of it. Um, somebody could issue a federated two-way peg on there if they feel so inclined, uh, etc. So then we maybe have to use the Tether chain that I uh, just described, where you have some sort of DEX thing allowing people to basically use, use the Tether to move in and out of fiat uh, without using an exchange. And then uh, we might have some kind of experimental sidechain technology that does something weird where there's actually one chain that connects to some other chain, a bunch of other chains maybe in a way that you know, doesn't require you to validate all the chains, only the chains you're interested in, but still somehow you have some kind of two-way pack between them. Um, and I may or may not be working on an idea like that, um, but that will be for another presentation. Uh, and then maybe finally, you will have some kind of DNS chain where uh, you maybe it's like, like a .com or something where you uh, store your URLs and you, you, you sell them onwards to, to other people. And what you can do is you can kind of like, you, know, you can chain these chains. Uh, and as I said earlier, what happens is that the children always have to validate the parents. So DNS number three is kind of, you have to validate DNS number two and DNS number one and the space chain in the middle and the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, all of that. So it becomes kind of like a lower tier uh, DNS essentially. So you can think of, uh, you know, maybe there's a DNS all, all the way to the end that only Bitcoiners use or something. Uh, and then DNS number one is maybe like the .com of DNS, something like that. Uh, whether that makes sense to like tier it like that, I don't know, but I just wanted to show it as an example. So uh, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, so in summary, space chains enable new blockchains that serve the Bitcoin ecosystem. Hopefully I've convinced you of that. And this is really something, so I guess maybe it's good to end on a note and say that you know, the way I look at Bitcoin is that it's, it's a resource that is really scarce, right? We have one block coming in every 10 minutes. It's only a couple of megabytes. Uh, not a lot of data can get in there. And we have to find ways to do more with that space, right? Without, um, without just putting everything in a single blockchain or without just adding trusted third parties. So even though this kind of system with these blockchains, there are some limitations, I think it's a novel set of trade-offs where it is completely trustless um, but it has some use limitations, such as there not being a two-way peg and things like that. Uh, but I think it's really where we have to go as an ecosystem. And, you know, if not today, then maybe five or ten years from now. Uh, I think having chains like this just makes sense, right? Where it's completely trustless, and you can move to them, and you can do your color coins there. Um, you know, take RGB for example. I think it's a really cool pro uh, project, uh, but it still utilizes the Bitcoin blockchain directly. And as block space becomes more scarce. I think those kinds of use cases become priced out, right? Where here you can create a, you know, let's say use the Tether blockchain where you can still have cheap fees because you can even create 10 use the Tether blockchains if you wanted. Um, as opposed to doing use the Tether as a color coin on the Bitcoin blockchain, where if you want to move your use the Tether, uh, you have to pay really high fees because the Bitcoin block space is so scarce. Uh, so that's roughly kind of my thinking. Uh, my, my feeling is that we have to move towards things like this. Uh, and that's also what motivates me to work on this. Um, so yeah, that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you're interested in talking more about this or just discussing with me or whatever, uh, please join me on Telegram at a channel I created called t.me slash space chains. So you can go there, you can chat with me and other people who are interested in this uh, on Telegram and maybe we can discuss kind of what this potential future for Bitcoin might look like. Thank you.